Hello friends, welcome to lecture 5.2 of the course on introduction to time frequency analysis and wavelet transforms. In this lecture, we are going to discuss mainly the theoretical properties of short time Fourier transform. In the previous lecture, that is 5.1, we introduced the definition of short time Fourier transform and we briefly discussed the filtering perspective which tells me that the short time Fourier transform essentially acts like a band pass filter of constant bandwidth and then also briefly discussed about the smearing that can uh, that occurs due to the use of the window function, smearing of the energy density due to the use of the window function. Today or in this lecture, we are actually going to talk about the theoretical properties, when we say theoretical properties, primarily we are referring to the spectrogram as a joint energy density. We have al already seen yesterday that perfect recovery of the signal is possible from short time Fourier transform. Therefore, I can use it for filtering applications. Primarily, we are going to talk about <coughs> how the joint energy density, in other words, the spectrogram behaves. And in this respect, you should recall the properties or the requirements that we had spelt out for the joint energy density in any time frequency analysis, <coughs> namely uh, the translation invariance or non-negativity, marginality and so on. And we are also going to talk about estimation of instantaneous frequencies from spectrogram. Again, the estimation part is going to be kept less theoretical and I will show you how to estimate this in MATLAB. We are also going to use today WaveLab toolbox. <coughs> so, if you are going to follow this lecture, you may want to keep your MATLAB window ready and have the WaveLab installed and set on your path. Before we begin to discuss the theoretical properties, let me make uh, certain notations and mathematical representations clear to you. On the left hand side here of the equation 1, I have the signal representation and on the right hand side, I have the time domain representation for the window. Given beneath each of this are the Fourier transforms of the signal and the window. At this point, I want to caution you or alert you on an important thing. In <coughs> discussing the basics of time frequency analysis, that is in uh, unit 4 on time frequency analysis, we had a 1 over root 2 pi in front of this integral here. So, let me make that clear once again. <coughs> in deriving the or in discussing the time frequency basics or foundations, we had used this definition for the Fourier transform of the continuous time signal. And likewise, x of t being 1 over root 2 pi, sorry, should be dt. Both running from minus infinity to infinity. Once again, here by omega, we are referring to the continuous time frequency. So, we had these definitions so that I could write the energy density. sorry, the energy itself as the area under mod x of t square and also as area under mod x of omega square. Remember, we call this as a unitary transform. This uh, convention we followed primarily keeping in mind the source of all the time frequency analysis foundations, which is, which was, uh, which is the book by Cohen. In order to avoid any confusion, I had followed this convention, but now we switch over to the regular definition that I had given for the continuous time Fourier transform, where the 1 over root 2 pi disappears here in front of the x of uh, integral for x of omega and this 1 over root 2 pi here is replaced with 1 over 2 pi, so that the energy density is now 1 over 2, uh, the energy itself is 1 over 2 pi integral of this and 
what is the consequence of this? Well, when you are computing averages and the spreads, the time, uh, particularly the frequency spreads and the frequency averages, you will now see a 1 over 2 pi appearing as you see on the slide. In the previous unit, you would not you wouldn't see this 1 over 2 pi. So, just this notational change occurs in this unit and also this makes it easy for you to follow the rest of the uh, literature, particularly in the uh, theory developed in Mallet's book and so on. So, please note this uh, simple change. We are moving now from unitary transforms to the regular transforms. Okay. So, with that note of uh, caution, let us proceed. Now, I have here the expression for the time averages computed from spectrogram that is joint density and the signal energy densities themselves. These expressions will become useful to us later on. So, what I am doing here is I am giving you expressions for the global average that you would compute from spectrogram. So, if I give you a spectrogram if I and I ask you how would you compute the average location uh, or, or the average center in time for the signal and the average frequency for the signal, you would use these expressions here. All right. And notice that I am using, in fact, this should be tau strictly speaking on the left hand side, but uh, as long as you remember that it is time, you should be okay. So, remember that we are evaluating a double integral here because the spectrogram is a two dimensional function. Likewise, here the center frequency computed from the spectrogram involves a double integral once again. The only difference is here I am computing with respect to uh, the first moment with respect to frequency and here the first moment with respect to time. These expressions in 3 b and 3 c are familiar to you. As I have just said in the unit 4, when we wrote the expressions for the center frequency of a signal, we did not have 1 over 2 pi, but now the 1 over 2 pi appears because now we have switched over from unitary transforms to the regular ordinary transform and therefore, I have a 1 over 2 pi here, but the rest of the expressions are uh, remain the same. All right. So, let us proceed. <coughs> first proper, the first property of interest for me is to check whether the joint energy density coming out from the short time Fourier transform is non-negative. We have define yesterday the spectrogram which gives me the joint energy density and we know why the spectrogram qualifies to be the energy density. By definition, the spectrogram is non-negative. So, there is not much to discuss here. It is fairly obvious that the joint energy density is going to be non-negative in the entire time frequency plane. Again here, I would like to make uh, an observation here. Strictly speaking, the joint energy density should have a factor of 1 over 2 pi here, but I am just following the convention that that is followed in Mallet's book. Strictly speaking, it is, should be a 1 over 2 pi because I am working with angular frequencies here. This z has units of angular frequency, but no worries. As long as you remember this uh, fact that the spectrogram is a squared magnitude of the short time Fourier transform, you are safe. So, let us examine the next important property which is the property of marginality condition or whether the spectrogram meets the marginality requirement. Recall what we mean by marginality requirement is if I integrate the joint energy density in one variable along one dimension, then I should recover the energy density along another dimension. So, that is exactly what I am doing here. Let us say I want to integrate uh, the spectrogram along the frequency axis. Then if the spectrogram satisfies the marginality requirement, what I should recover is the signal's energy density in time because I am walking along frequency axis. Right? This 1 over 2 pi again comes here because of the change in notation. Now, what I have done here is I have indicated this with s hat of tau. s hat of tau is energy density as a function of tau which has units of time t and as I just said, if everything comes out all right, 
that is if the spectrogram satisfies the marginality requirement, then this integral should evaluate to mod x of tau square. Let us see if it does. What I have done here is now the I have substituted for the spectrogram the definition itself, where I have written spectrogram as x of t times w of t minus tau times x star of t prime times w star of t prime minus tau times this factor here. The reason these conjugates appear is because spectrogram, if you see it is a modular square, but I might as well rewrite this modular magnitude square as the product of this complex number times its conjugate itself. right? And then I use the definition of the short time Fourier transform itself. So, that is all I have done, there is nothing new here. The only point here is I have now a triple integral, but no worries we will be able to simplify it fairly easily. Now, all we are doing here is we are uh, rewriting here, there is a d z that is missing here, you should uh, make note of that, uh, sorry. The d z is missing here because I have in evaluated this exponential along the z dimension. In fact, what should not be present here is this e to the j z times t prime minus t. So, that should be taken out, that does not appear. So, when I integrate e to the j z t prime minus t along the z, then I get Dirac delta function. This is a definition of one of the definitions of a Dirac delta function. Let me write that for you. Integral minus infinity to infinity e to the j z, let us say some variable y and let us say I am evaluating this from minus infinity to infinity for in terms of d z. Then this is simply delta, the Dirac delta of z. This is one of the definitions of the Dirac delta function. You may refer to the literature. A similar result we had used, not exactly this result, but a similar result we had used in deriving the analytic associate of a given signal. There, the integral ran from 0 to infinity, but now the integral runs from minus infinity to infinity. So, that is why there is a change in result. If you go back to the derivation of the analytic signal, you will see that this integ that integral there runs from 0 to infinity and then you have an extra term here. All right. So, keep that in mind. We have just used this property and replaced this integral, one integral of e to the j z t prime minus t times uh, or, uh, d z with the Dirac delta function itself. Therefore, this factor e to the j z in the second equation should vanish, it should not be there. And then using the property of the Dirac delta function, the double integral simply reduces to a single integral, a line integral. And all I have done here is I have substituted for x of t prime and w of t in terms of the representations that we had used here in equation 1, right. Because I am evaluating the magnitudes, the phases do not participate. The final result that I have here is that I do not get the marginal equal to mod of x of tau square, which is what I should have ideally if the spectrogram satisfied the marginality requirement. Now, what this means is if I walk along the frequency axis and add up the energy densities, I do not get the energy density at that particular time t. Whatever time you pick, you will not recover the energy density. However, the total energy requirement is satisfied as we will talk about it shortly and we have seen that yesterday uh, in the previous lecture as well. Okay. So, <clears throat> you can follow a similar derivation here and prove that the frequency marginal evaluated by integrating the spectrogram along the time dimension is not equal to the true or the signal's frequency marginal. So, that is again the story that we have here as expected. And therefore, you have to be careful when you are working with the uh, spectrogram and you are fixing your position at a particular time t and you are summing up the energy density along all frequencies or even over a band of frequencies. Let us ask what is the consequence of this violation of the marginality requirement. At, 
because it is not immediately obvious why this is such an important result. Well, there are two at least two consequences there, there are many, but of the many there are two important consequences. One is that the global average computed from the spectrogram they does not coincide with the ones that you compute from the signal. Earlier we had defined the global averages namely the average time t computed from the spectrogram and the average frequency here computed from the spectrogram in equation 3 a. These quantities here will not equal for example, uh, to the ones that I compute from the signal. For instance, I have here the uh, average time t computed from spectrogram that will not equal to the average time that I compute from the signal itself. Why? Because there is a window that is standing between you and the signal when you uh, take the short time Fourier transform. And in fact, I will give you the exact expression for the average time computed from the spectrogram in terms of the averages of the signal and window likewise for the frequencies as well. I will give that to you very soon. But let me point out a more important consequence that arises out of this lack of uh, or the violation of the marginality requirement condition. The most important consequence is that the uncertainty principle has to be re-derived for the spectrogram. We just mentioned that the global averages computed from the spectrogram do not coincide. Not only do the global averages not coincide, but also the sorry the spreads that I compute from the spectrogram. What I mean by spread is suppose I want to compute the duration of the signal from the spectrogram rather than from the signal, then they will not match. Likewise, if I want to compute the bandwidth of the signal from the spectrogram rather than from the signal, they will also not coincide. right? Now, remember that we derived the uh, duration bandwidth principle or the uncertainty principle for the signal, but now we are saying that I cannot use that same duration bandwidth principle for the spectrogram. So, let me actually discuss that a bit more in detail now. So, what I have first of all is <coughs> the time average computed from the spectrogram is in fact, you can show starting with the definitions that we had in the uh, equations 3 a, 3 b and 3 c in fact, 3 a. You can show that the global average that you compute from the spectrogram is related to the global uh, is, is related to the time averages of the signal and the window in by this expression. And likewise, okay. so <clears throat> when I choose a real and symmetric window, then the averages of the window will go to 0. That way I can ensure that these two coincide. right? However, when I look at the spreads which is a more serious issue. In fact, before jumping into the spreads, let me give you the expression for the average of t square. That is remember the reason for giving this is because I know that sigma square t for a signal is given by this expression here. Already we have given the expression for this. In order to compute sigma square s p that is the duration of the signal if I want to compute from the spectrogram, then I need an expression for this and I already have an expression for this therefore, I can evaluate. Okay. So, what I have here is This is the expression that I have for the average of t square computed from the spectrogram and likewise the average uh, 
of the squared frequency shares a relation with those of the signal and the window by this expression. Now, I can compute the sigma square t square sigma, sigma square t for the spectrogram and in fact, if you use this expression you apply this expression to the case of computing from the spectrogram and for that of the signal and for that of the uh, window itself. You can show just working out the algebra this would turn out to be sigma square t x plus sigma square t w assuming that I have chosen a real and symmetric window right which means the averages of the window in time and frequency are 0 and likewise for the bandwidths as well. So, now I have this result the duration let us this is a square duration, but I will just with some uh, abuse of terminology I will call this as a duration the duration here from computed from the spectrogram is the duration computed from the signal plus the duration computed from the uh, duration of the window itself. Likewise the bandwidth of the this is a very interesting result the bandwidth that I compute from the spectrogram is the bandwidth of the signal plus the bandwidth of the window. Now, this bandwidth of the window can never go to 0 it cannot because I am going to use a finite window that is a window of finite length its bandwidth cannot be 0 it has to be a non-zero value. Therefore, this is never equal to this and likewise this is never going to be equal to 0 unless I choose an impulse like window right. So, in in general this the duration and bandwidth of the uh, spectrogram is going to be different from that of the signal these are not local duration and bandwidths what the difference between local and global is that a local duration or bandwidth is when you are analyzing in a local time frequency cell. Now, what we mean by deriving rederiving the duration bandwidth principle for the spectrogram is that this product here cannot be expected to be bounded below by 1 over 4 this is not possible. Why is that because the duration bandwidth principle says any signal or any function let us say denoted by x of t and whose Fourier transform is denoted by x of omega and let us say the duration of the signal in time is sigma square t and computed likewise uh, the bandwidth computed from x of omega they share or rather they satisfy this duration bandwidth principle which means the sigma square t and sigma square omega have to be computed from the signal and its Fourier transform right. But here that is not true what we mean by this is these are not computed from marginals in the sense how I, how am I computing uh, from the original marginals these I am computing this from what is giving me this this is uh, this duration global duration from the spectrogram s hat of t that we had seen earlier. That is when I compute the marginal from the spectrogram and then I use that to compute the duration that is a global duration that I get. Likewise here to compute the global bandwidth from the spectrogram I have to evaluate the marginal from the spectrogram this is different from the energy density that I compute directly from the signal. So, sigma square t is actually coming s of t and sigma square omega well strictly speaking over 2 pi is going to give me this bandwidth and these energy densities themselves 
are coming from a Fourier transform relation. But s hat of t and s hat of omega are not falling out of a Fourier relation that is because the spectrogram does not satisfy the marginality property. Therefore, this bound is not right nevertheless the, these still satisfy a product like relation. The question is what is this bound? Just because 1 over 4 is not the right answer it does not mean that the global duration and bandwidth computed from the spectrogram do not satisfy a lower bound. Now, how do I determine this lower bound? Well, there has been some work done already, but then a quick a quick calculation here that when I compute this product, I am actually computing the product of these terms and I have four terms essentially. One of the first term being, so this actually evaluates to sigma square t times sigma square omega that is of the signal plus These, the, these terms are the product of the duration bandwidth of the window and then the two cross terms that I have. This itself the least value of this is 1 over 4 from the duration bandwidth principle. I know already that the least value for this is 1 over 4, the least value for this is 1 over 4 and then I have two more, but do not expect that these are also bounded below by 1 over 4. But if you think that way, coincidentally the, uh, the bound for this turns out to be 1. So, the global duration and the global bandwidth that I compute from the spectrogram are actually bounded below by 1. Of course, the question is so what? I mean how does it matter? Well, rather than looking upon this as a lower bound, the way it can be looked upon is it tells me how fast the bandwidth changes when the duration changes, right. <clears throat> Here for the signal or for any function, the uh, bandwidth actually changes according to this 1 over 4. So, if the duration is increased by a certain factor, then the bandwidth is more or less going to increase. 2 times the duration, but here the story is different and essentially what we are trying to say here is that the global duration and bandwidth that you compute from the spectrogram are related, but they are related in a different way and the spectrogram makes things worse than that of the signal when it comes to global properties. It should be expected because as far as the global properties are concerned. For nothing can beat the Fourier transform, okay. But locally, you may have an improvement, and to evaluate what is happening locally, one has to actually work with the product of sigma square t given omega times sigma square omega given t. So, this also it turns out has a certain lower bound. In fact, the first thing that we can say is that it has an upper bound which is that of <coughs> the value of the global product itself. That means, local properties cannot be worse than what you see globally. That is what it means and you can show that it is also bounded below by <coughs> the sigma square t sigma omega of the signal. What essentially these results tell me is globally the spectrogram is not such a useful tool as expected, which means if I know that there is a certain frequency component that is spread all over time, I should not be using spectrogram, I should be using Fourier analysis. But locally that is the local properties are going to be much better than what I am uh, than the global behavior and definitely it is going to be better than what the Fourier transform can give you. So, that is the uh, summary of these observations. So, the marginality property has an important consequence.
moving on the uh, we remarked earlier and even yesterday we have seen this result the area under the spectrogram gives me the energy uh, uh, the of the signal itself therefore the spectrogram satisfies the total energy requirement which is good because even if this is not satisfied then it's not such a useful tool so let's ask if the short time fourier transform is sensitive to translation uh, covariance in the sense does it if there is a translate of that signal in time is it reflected appropriately in the energy density and likewise if there is a frequency modulation does the spectrogram reflect the same mathematically yes if i have a frequency shift typically we talk of frequency shifts in terms of modulations then the spectrogram is uh, sensitive to that that means you can see that the center of the energy density now shifts to whatever frequency is being given here this should be omega not here and if i have a time shift then the spectrogram is actually uh, sensitive to the uh, in fact this is not just the spectrogram this is actually the uh, short time fourier transform itself that i have written the spectrogram would be invariant to this uh, factor here so i'll make that small correction later on here is an illustration of these properties here what i have done is i have taken a gaussian modulated signal here and i generate this signal through the atoms routine in time frequency toolbox the syntax for which you can look up i am generating 256 observations of this what i am doing here is there is a gaussian modulated frequency wave amplitude modulated frequency wave of frequency 0.3 it dies down here exponentially and then stays idle for a while then i have a frequency lower frequency 0.1 once again gaussian modulated then that dies down then the same frequency reappears in other words this feature has actually translated itself think of it as a translation the joint energy density does show that and you can think of this change in frequency as a frequency shift so it has shifted from 0.3 to 0.1 and the spectrogram is able to nicely pick those frequency and time shifts of course what you will find here is that it has also nicely picked up the time localization of these features and that's a coincidence because i have chosen the window width exactly equal to the width of this uh, feature each of this feature if i choose a different window width and you should try this out you will see that it may not be able to pick exactly the time localization but whatever it is the, you will see the shifts right of course as usual we have the spectrum here show, showing frequencies 0.1 and 0.3 okay so uh, just a note here the atoms routine will return an analytic signal so you don't have to actually take an analytic representation of xk you can directly pass that to the tfr stf this is something that we have discussed yesterday the time frequency resolution of short time fourier transform essentially the time resolution of the that is time localization of the short time fourier transform is at best the window itself it, you cannot get a finer resolution or localization of the energy than the width of the window as expected and you cannot get a better frequency localization than the spread of the window in the frequency so that is your window is really uh, limiting your ability to see through the signal it's like you're wearing some colored glasses and looking at the signal right finally we'll talk about instantaneous frequency estimation i gave you an example yesterday of a linear chirp and what we noted is that the maximum that is the local maximum of the spectrogram recovers the instantaneous frequency for that example and we asked if the it was a coincidence in the previous lecture now i'm giving you the general result i'm avoiding the theoretical proof it's fairly involved i refer you to mallet's book chapter 4 there is a derivation there's a theorem and a huge uh, long derivation for the, for the proof the final result as far as practicality is concerned utility is concerned that the points of maxima of the spectrogram which are known as ridges the frequencies at which this maxima occur locally in time will give me estimates of the instantaneous frequency that is the essence of that result okay but remember that these instantaneous frequency calculations are only good within the resolution of the transform that is if 
remember we said a signal can have multiple frequencies at a given time. If these multiple frequencies are spaced less than the frequency localization ability of the window, then you will have a problem. Right? We just now said at best you can resolve the frequencies dep uh, dep depending on the window properties. The window's frequency spread will determine your ability to do it. So let's look at this example of the linear chirp that we used uh, yesterday, that is for which we derived the theoretical expression. Here I am using the wave lab, not the time frequency toolbox. I have here the, uh, well I am using both time frequency toolbox and wave lab. Time frequency toolbox for generating the signal. I am generating a linear chirp and what I am doing here is using the window FT which computes a short time Fourier transform in wave lab to uh, pass it on to a routine that I have written called spectrogram underscore plot which essentially plots this uh, the figure that you see here at the left bottom. On the top you have the chirp, on the left panel you have the spectrum and here you have the spectrogram. Yeah, it nicely follows the frequency changing behavior but of course the frequency localization or the uh, energy localization in the frequency domain is spread because I know that at any instant there is there should be a single frequency. But I cannot get that with the short time Fourier transform because of the window. The window, the window's bandwidth is the one that is masking the true frequency. And what you see on the right here is I have actually seen through, I have kind of unmasked what is happening as a consequence of the windowing and picked up the local maxima and I have the instantaneous frequencies here, right. So very nice, so this is a very nice result and this is extensively used in calculating local frequencies, also used in image analysis and so on. These are called ridges and we will see a similar result even with wavelet transforms where we follow the scalograms instead of spectrograms. Another example where I have two parallel chirps, both these examples are taken from Mallet's book. And once again here I generate two chirps, add them up. So one starts to chirp up and the other starts to chirp down. They both meet as at a certain point here at this point in the center. Again I follow a similar procedure as far as MATLAB is concerned. You should try to run all these codes by yourself and check if you indeed get these results. The ridge underscore window as you have seen in the previous code is the one that gets me, that gets you the uh, instantaneous frequency estimates. And as I mentioned earlier, at this point when the frequencies of both chirps have come very close at the point of meeting, they, they have come so close that they are beyond the resolvability of the window itself. And there you see some meaningless results, right. You see that there are four frequencies and so on and that is expected because you are working with the, with the mathematical definition of instantaneous frequency. But outside this time zone, I have the instantaneous frequencies nicely resolved. So which is very good. So the spectrogram not only gives me the joint energy density, it not only gets me the local behavior but also facilitates computation of instantaneous frequencies. So that, that is a summary. So with that, we will close this lecture and these are some of the references again that we have used in developing the lecture material. Please go through the lecture once again because this lecture is fairly theoretical, particularly the derivation of the uh, lower bound for the product of duration and bandwidth, global duration bandwidth that I compute from the spectrogram and so on. Rather than worrying just about the theoretical result, in fact, you should be asking what is the consequence of each of this result in practicality or with respect to a certain application. Some of these properties may not be relevant to a particular application that you are looking at. But Given the academic nature of this uh, course, we, we discuss all the properties. In the next lecture, we are going to study the effect of windows. We have seen to a certain extent, but we will exclusively devote the lecture to two things. One, how the choice of window length and the choice of window can affect the computation or the joint energy density itself. And two, how is short time Fourier transform computed in practice? That is a discrete version of it. Until now we have studied the theoretical property. So see you in the next lecture. Thank you.